correlations between the microcosm and the macrocosm. Our lecture today will consist of a recapitulation of all we have heard in the course of the various lectures given here this winter. Together they may be taken as a continuation of the lectures on the Gospels of St. Luke and St. Matthew and of what was given here with reference to the lectures on the Gospel of St. John that I gave in Stockholm. From the nature of these lectures it will be clear that there was never any question of explaining the Gospels in the narrow sense, but rather that from their truths, which really are truths in themselves and as such can be found in the Gospels, if rightly understood, light can be thrown in different ways upon other riddles of life. When we go back beyond the founding of Christianity, we find two different kinds of initiation, that of the North, described in more detail in the Stockholm lectures mentioned above, and that of the South, whose chief characteristic is its connection with the Egyptian methods of initiation. In the world of the ancients, there were two different methods by which they could penetrate the spiritual world. In old Egypt, a candidate for initiation had to descend beyond all that plays its part in the ordinary soul life as thinking, feeling, and willing, and the like, into the depths of his soul. There he found the divine spiritual life of the world from which the soul came forth, a descent beneath those regions of the soul that are illuminated and permeated by the ego was the essential point in the Egyptian or, indeed, in any southern initiation. In the northern initiation, however, the object striven for was that man should come out of himself and expand into the phenomena of the world in a state of ecstasy. This was especially the case in the Germanic Druidic mysteries and in those of the Trotten. We have heard how these two kinds of initiation were combined in one stream, in what, in what we call the Christian initiation, and how this represented a higher unity that combined the ecstatic initiation of the North with the mystical contraction of the South. Here we are given an indication of the deeper foundations of the cosmic mysteries that permeate all existence. In reality, the fact of this foundation is as great and mighty as the fusion of the two different forms of initiation of ancient times into the one single form of Christian initiation. It is an example of an important and even more comprehensive law that permeates all human existence and is interwoven in all external world phenomena insofar as these are known to man. We find ourselves confronted everywhere by opposites, by the two parts of a duality. The northern and southern initiations are one example of two polarities that confront us in the life of the world. The other, the Christian initiation, in which these two forms of initiation flow together and celebrate a spiritual marriage, as it were, is an example of how opposites, dualities, unite. This takes place ceaselessly. Unities separate into dualities to further evolution, and dualities reunite again to form unities. We can point externally to one important fact that extends beyond human evolution and is illustrative of this division of unity into duality and back. We have often thrown light on the Lemurian epoch in which the separation of the moon from our earth, so important to the evolution of the world, occurred. It was also in Lemurian times that the first beginnings of the separation of the sexes into the opposites, man and woman, took place. In preceding ages only sexual unity prevailed. This original unity separated into man and woman. We have already indicated, moreover, that in a future age the two sexes will again become one, that the duality of the sexes will become a unity, a unity will come forth from a duality. That is the external indication of a far-reaching series of facts connected with the relation of two to one or one to two. <clears throat> what we thus encounter in the development of mankind is actually the expression, the image of a still greater cosmic polarity rooted in a unity, greater than this example from our contemporary life of the two sexes that in a distant future will be fused into one. It is necessary that we should take every one of the thoughts given us by spiritual science in its full depths and not allow ourselves to form the habit 
of taking them in the same superficial way we do other prevailing thoughts and conceptions, which our present civilization, in its hasty and superficial triviality, accepts. The thoughts of spiritual science must be taken as earnestly as possible. Therefore the thought which has often been spoken of, and indeed underlies all our teaching, that man as a small world, as a microcosm, is born from the macrocosm, the great world, must not be, must not simply be taken as an abstract thought. In its content it is manifold and infinite. We must above all realize that the world is more profound than is supposed. Even when we have grasped a polarity of truth in one of its aspects, that does not mean by any means, that does not by any means signify that we know the last truth about it. Rather must we patiently wait and observe, so that When we come to know one side of a thing, we should then try to learn what refers to the other. Man is born from the whole cosmos. He must look up to it as to his father-mother being of whom he himself is an image. His man is an image of the whole world with which he is acquainted. There is nothing in the being of man that does not in some way relate to what can be found in the great cosmos. When we compare man, as seen today in the light of spiritual science, with the forms of humans of earlier ages, we find, among others, one characteristic feature of immense importance for the understanding of the nature of man. Concerning what we know of the world, it can teach all of us that to have simply said that something is true is not of sole importance. There is something else, something quite different besides. When a man has simply proved the truth of a thing, he has not even told us what is of greatest importance in it. There is much truth, for example, in what a mediocre natural scientist might relate of the resemblance between man and the higher mammals. It is an indisputable truth that man has the same number of bones and muscles and so on, but even after this has been proved, the last word on the subject has not been said. Man must learn through the deepening and inwardness of spiritual science to acquire a feeling for the value of a particular truth, to sense whether or not it is essentially important to the elucidation of things. People come along today who speak out of their banal consciousness and continually assure us of the truth of their assertions. We have no wish to contradict them, but the point is whether or not their assertions are of value in understanding the world. Now there is a certain fact, the value of which, in its significance to man, should be realized and felt in the right way. It is undeniably true, and everyone is acquainted with it because we meet it over and over again every day, this is the fact that man stands and walks upright and can gaze up into the space around him. Only man is capable of that. Even though the apes look as though they might possess this ability, they have somehow missed it, since they cannot walk upright. Man is the only being who has succeeded in raising his countenance freely up into the space around him. This fact is immeasurably more important than all those that a mediocre natural science tells us about the position occupied by man among the animals. What science says is true, but this other is of much greater importance. To feel the force of it, we must acquaint ourselves with the reason why man is a being who walks upright, a being certainly still bound to the earth, but who, through his mental outlook and sense perceptions, has raised himself to an upright position. The reason behind man's assuming an upright position is that there is a certain polarity, a duality in the cosmos, that corresponds to another duality in man. We can indicate a duality in the universe and a duality in man as two opposites existing in the microcosm and the macrocosm. That in the macrocosm, in the great world, consists of sun and earth. The same polarity exists also in man, between his head and his hands and feet, his limbs. As time goes on, these things will be explored more fully, but here we must acquaint ourselves with them and come to feel that, in a certain respect, the head and the limbs of man bear the same relation to each other as the sun does to the earth in our solar system. 
In the earth there are certain mysterious forces that bind man to it, and acting throughout the ages they have brought about the whole form and movement of man's hands and feet. The forces that have lifted his countenance up in space, transforming him from a being who gazes upon the earth to one who can look out into the infinite distances of cosmic space, are to be found in the sun. Anyone with the right feeling will have the same impression when contemplating the self-evident polarity between man's head and limbs, as he will when he turns his attention to the polarity between the sun and the earth. The polarity between head and limbs will one day become a unity in the life of man, as will that between sun and earth. The sun and earth were once a single being that later divided to form a du duality. Some day they will be reunited, difficult as it may seem to imagine today. The polarity in man between head and limbs will also one day become a unity. We have here pointed to a polarity in man and to a corresponding polarity in the universe. There are, however, other polarities in man that also have corresponding counterparts in the universe. Regarding the polarity between the head and limbs, all human beings on earth, male or female, are alike. In this respect there is no difference between them and other polarities, including those of the soul. Let me read that again. In this respect there is no difference between them and other polarities including those of the soul, are not affected by them. If the polarity between the head and limbs were the only one existing in either the microcosm or macrocosm, man and woman would be alike. But as it is, man and woman also form another polarity in man's being. Now we may ask if we cannot also find a polarity in the universe that corresponds to the polarity between man and woman in earthly life. That too can be found but before we can look for it, we must acquaint ourselves, to some extent, with the polarity between man and woman in an occult sense. In so doing, we must not fall into the error of our materialistic age, which, taking it simply as a question of sex, applies the polarity between man and woman to the whole universe. Not only is that trite, but our learned men take liberties when they consider that what is found in one domain is applicable to every other. The polarity in the universe that corresponds to that existing on earth between man and woman cannot be called male and female. That would be an impossibility. We must investigate the occult foundations of this other polarity. The polarity between male and female in our earthly evolution does not of course apply to the human being. The human being as such is the same in both man and woman. When we speak of man and woman, we only refer to their physical and etheric bodies. This has nothing to do with the inner being of man, so that we cannot speak in an occult sense as, though in our, as those in our materialistic age do. Man and woman each possess an astral body and an ego. Ordinary perception, however, knows nothing of what makes a man or woman a human being, since with ordinary perception one can only speak of them as one senses them. We are not now speaking of the human being as such, in man or woman, however, but of what constitutes a man or a woman, merely their outer sheaths. This must be thoroughly understood, because if what is about to be said were to be applied to the human being as such, it would be completely wrong. The polarity between man and woman within these limitations is as follows. In primeval ages, the external human form was totally different, the present human male and female forms have gradually evolved from an earlier single form that had not yet divided into two. There was formerly a unity, where now there is a polarity between man and woman. Now we also know that the earlier single form was of a finer, more spiritual kind. Only in the course of time did man develop his dense material form. When we look back, we find not only a single form, but also one that was more spiritual than the human form is today. We find a primeval human being, neither man nor woman, unity as yet undivided and finer, more etheric and spiritual than the latter, later, more material human being, who was separated into man and woman. What was the cause of the original unity having later developed into man and woman? It came about because when the unity became a duality, 
the woman formed a physical body for herself that did not completely pass from the earlier form into the normal material form, if we may say such a thing. <clears throat> Woman's body remained at a more spiritual stage and did not fully descend into the material. It has certainly become dense and material, but it has at the same time retained an earlier, more spiritual form. Thus, a spiritual stage has become material. The body of woman has, as it were, retained an earlier, more spiritual form that has not descended completely into matter. Though it has become material, its form is still the form the human being originally possessed. Hence we may say that woman is a manifestation of an earlier formation that was intended to be spiritual and, as seen today, is actually false, a maya or illusion. If we accept the idea that at a certain point in evolution a leap forward was made and matter became crystallized, we can say that woman did not press forward as far as that point, but crystallized an earlier form. To one who can really perceive the facts of life, or who learns them through imaginative cognition, a woman's body is a somewhat truer imprint of the spiritual behind it, only as far as the head and limbs are concerned, that is to say, that her head and limbs alone express in their material appearance something of a resemblance to their spiritual counterpart. The spiritual, behind the material form, however, does not look exactly the same, because the head and limbs are not true forms. So the saying that the world is maya can be applied to every area of life. It is easy to state that the world is maya, but a man cannot grasp the meaning of such a statement if he does not seriously inquire in how far forms are illusion. Some are more so, others less. There are those that in their outer semblance express the spiritual behind them, at any rate approximately. These are the head and limbs. There are others that are completely wrong and quite out of keeping. This is the rest of the body. When the world comes to understand these things, it will no longer speak as foolishly as it does today, because it will then see that a certain deep yet more delicate artistic sense tells us that the female form, with the exception of the head and limbs, is quite out of keeping with the spiritual form, and if it is to be artistically represented, the defects must be corrected. In more truly artistic times this was actually done. No one who really has an eye for form can fail to see that in the Venus of Milo the form has been somewhat corrected. As a rule this is not observed. In this way we have divided the human being into two parts, consisting of those bodily members that are less illusionary and those that are more so. This does not apply to woman alone. Where a man is concerned, the whole thing is reversed. Man is the opposite pole. Just as the female form did not descend as far as the normal point necessary for rightly expressing the spirit in matter, but crystallized at an earlier stage, so the male body leaped just as far beyond the normal point as the female form fell short of it. The male body descended more deeply than normal into materiality, and this is manifested in its outer form. It would have been quite a different appearance if it had not leapt past the midpoint. Only in the head and limbs does the human body even approximately correspond to truth. Regarding the rest of its form, we must say that the female body, having reached a certain point, remained at a standstill. It consolidated before the waves of material existence broke over it. Hence, it manifests quite a different form from what we, have, from what we should have seen if it had waited until it had come in contact with material life before crystallizing. Contrary-wise, the male body plunged too deeply down and is just as badly drawn as that of woman. Thus the woman's body manifests a distorted form in the spiritual, while the man's body is distorted in the material. The true form would fall between the two and would consist of a happy average of both. Of course, insofar as he has a physical sheath, these distortions affect the whole human being in his earth life. This refers to the whole human being in one incarnation, between birth and death, not the polarity between the head and limbs. 
we incarnate either as man or woman. In so doing, we have to take into account what is distorted and badly drawn in both. That, however, extends to the whole human being, with the consequence that if in one incarnation one has the body of a woman, the whole of this female body is influenced by the fact of its having remained behind at an earlier stage, when the form was more pliable. <clears throat> in a male incarnation, the whole physical body is permeated with the effects of having plunged down too strongly into coarse, solid matter. If people had even the smallest inkling of what it means to think in the spirit, to live in the spirit, using the physical body only as an instrument, so that one does not feel firmly fastened into and identified with it, they would sing psalms about the misery of having to use a male body in an incarnation, because these material effects have, of course, also filtered into the brain. One observes that the forms of the male brain, through having gone deeper into matter, are more difficult to manage than the more flexible forms of the female brain. It is truly more difficult to train a male brain for the ascent into the higher worlds and to translate truths into thoughts that it is to, than it is to train a female brain. Thus it is not surprising to people who think that when a new conception of the world arises, such as spiritual science, it is more easily grasped by the more flexible female brain. The male brain, being less pliable and obedient, finds it more difficult to free itself from certain thoughts that it has acquired. Spiritual science, therefore, will not be easily accepted by the men who are the leaders of culture and cultured ideas today. We must realize how awkward an instrument is the brain of a learned man today, not only for the acceptance of spiritual science, but also for thinking along its lines. We must not look at these things in a wrong way, however, and draw the wrong conclusions. Rather, should we see it as all the more significant that there are so many men whose brains are pliant enough to have become intimately acquainted with spiritual science? These things can merely be hinted at, but if you allow them to work on you and then reflect on them, you will find immense perspectives opening out regarding the life of man. When we think of human life in terms of its two opposites, man and woman, we are confronted with two forms, one that has remained at a standstill at an earlier stage and one that has jumped on beyond the present stage, drawing into the present a form intended for the future. It is, however, a caricature. The female has preserved an earlier form. The male has taken on a later form but has made it what it must not be in the future. It is incorrect because it has brought later conditions of life into an age as yet too early for them. Can a polarity be found in the cosmos that corresponds to the polarity between male and female? Is there anything in the cosmos that shows us a development that has retained earlier forms and carried these over into a later age, on the one hand, and on the other, forms that have transcended a certain stage, thus representing the caricatured form of a future state? <coughs> if we recall the specific development we know from the Akashic Chronicle, we may put the question thus. Is there in the outside cosmos anything resembling an existence on the old moon that would not enter existence on the earth, but that still retained in the cosmos something feminine from the old moon? Is there anything that carries into the present something belonging to an earlier stage of an old moon existence? Is there in the cosmos anything that has gone beyond a certain stage and is condensed and thickened so that it represents a later Jupiter condition? There is. There is in the cosmos the same polarity we have described between male and female, the polarity between a comet and the moon. To understand the nature of a comet, wandering as it does in cosmic space, regardless of the other laws of the solar system, we must clearly recognize that the comet carries the laws of the old moon existence into our own. It has preserved those laws and enters our existence with them. It has taken on the present substance of the solar and terrestrial system, but in its motion and nature it has remained behind at the stage of natural law that prevailed in the solar system when our earth was still old moon. It carries a former into a later present condition, just as the female body carries an earlier condition into the present. 
The nature of the comet is one part of a polarity and that of the moon the other. When in the Lemurian age the moon evolved from the earth, it took with it certain portions that had to be removed in order that the human being might develop further. The earth was not destined to become as dense as it would have become if it had retained the moon. The moon actually represents a caricature of the Jupiter condition. Just as it is possible for a fresh ripe fruit to become petrified, so the moon transcended the midpoint form as did the human male form. Exactly the same polarity found between male and female can be found in the cosmos between the natures of moon and comets. Thus are these things connected. As the sun is connected with the earth, so head to limbs, as moon to comet, so man to woman in the human being. Here again we must not go home saying, well, now we have some nice polarities to observe. Rather must we take these things seriously, remembering that on other occasions I have said things additional to these. <clears throat> we must consider the fact that a man is only male as regards his physical body. He is female in his etheric body, whereas a woman is only female in her physical body. A woman can only be said to be female as far as her physical body is concerned. In a man, that can be said of his etheric body. Thus the relation of the etheric body of a man to the etheric body of a woman is that of comet to moon. If you like, you may say that this confuses everything again. Nevertheless, these things are so. In a culture that has created its ideas with a densified brain, these same ideas tend to form dense outlines that cannot be modified. Thus, when the ideas are once formed, they must be retained. The spirit, however, does not permit this. It is mobile, and when we form ideas, we, mu we must keep them mobile. So we must apply what has just been said on the relation of the moon and comets to man and woman, to the male in the woman and the female in the man. This applies to the male and female elements in the human being, not to man and woman externally. We have now uncovered some extremely interesting connections between the development of the human being and that of the cosmos. Of course, as I have already observed, those who sit in the high places of true scientific, scientific observation will consider what has just been said about the comets and the moon as utterly wild and absurd. That cannot be helped, since they do not want to investigate the truth. On the ground of spiritual science, however, we can build a bridge between what comes from the spiritual and what is seen on the physical plane, even though these others will not do so. During the Congress in Paris in 1906, I called attention to the fact that spiritual investigation was able to say from its knowledge of the nature of comets that since the combinations of carbon and oxygen play the same part on our earth as combinations of carbon and nitrogen, cyanogen did on the old moon, cometary life must contain cyanides, combinations of carbon and nitrogen. Those who have followed these things attentively will remember this. Our spiritual science, therefore, some time ago, announced that comets must contain cyanogen in some form. During the last few weeks, this fact has been mentioned in the newspapers as something having been discovered externally by spectro analysis. This is only one case among hundreds in which spiritual investigation builds bridges for the facts of external research. In this case, spectro analysis asserts what spiritual science had stated years before. The results of external materialistic investigation never contradict those of spiritual research. We may refer to statements such as that mentioned above when those who sit in the high places of true science continually point to external facts. But we must not confuse these facts with the limited conclusions these people draw for themselves. If everything taken for natural science today was really a fact, natural science would greatly contradict spiritual science. The facts of the scientists, however, are not facts, but only the corrupted conceptions of those who, because of prevailing conditions, are led to deal with such things. Now, having brought forth, excuse me, now having brought the polarity to be found in human life, as well as in the cosmos, to mind, we may ask, what is brought forth from the universe as a result? 
It is difficult to describe in a rather short time the immensity underlying such a question. Allow me, by way of example, therefore, to describe the life of man as it runs its course when seen externally. First of all, we see a good citizen pursuing the course of his life from day to day. He gets up in the morning, eats his breakfast, and goes through the rest of the day in accordance with the usual rules. There are certain events, however, that can intervene suddenly in a man's life, bringing about precipitate changes in the course of the day. Take the case, for example, of a husband and wife who live for a while as good citizens with but little variety in their lives. Then something occurs that actually causes an alteration in the ordinary external circumstances of their lives. When a new human being incarnates and enters life as a citizen of the world, the event causes an abrupt alteration, a great change in the ordinary processes of everyday life. When a new world citizen appears on the horizon, something actually occurs that gives the whole family connection a new form. I have brought this case forward as an example from which we can gain a little understanding of the deep occult background of cometary life. In the cosmos also, life goes on from day to day and year to year, like the life of a good citizen. One day is like another. The sun rises and sets, plants blossom in spring and wither away in autumn, and when there is rain, sunshine, hail, or the like, we can compare them to the events of ordinary life. When, for instance, instead of the usual five o'clock tea, we have a little party. We see these things happening as a matter of course, and it all hangs together because of the laws underlying the movements of sun, earth, and so on, and the way in which these continue day by day, year by year. Into this regular process the rarer, yet in a certain respect recurrent, appearances of the comets intervene. They come upon the processes of cosmic happenings like a new citizen entering the lives of a husband and wife. <clears throat> Through the appearance of a comet, in the cosmos, something is actually brought about in the life of humanity that could not occur in the ordinary process of life. If evolution is to advance, not only must the daily repetitions continue, but something new must also be, must be also introduced. Just as something quite special enters the life of a family with the birth of a new earth citizen, so something quite new and different enters the progression of the human race on earth through the appearance of a comet. It breaks through the ordinary process of cosmic existence, and when it appears, it is actually as though something new were born. One who can investigate these things spiritually is able to indicate quite definitely the different functions of the separate comets and how each one has something spiritually new to introduce into the world. Thus Halley's comet, in its periodic appearances, always introduces something specially new to the life of man. Whereas things otherwise recur in the ordinary way, this comet brings about a new birth in human inner life and culture. I can only make clear what I mean by referring to the two last appearances of Halley's Comet in 1759 and 1835, and the one we are now expecting. Other comets have other tasks, but what are the tasks of these three appearances? New births in the universe are not always to be greeted with the same joy as the birth of a young citizen in a family. All sorts are born into the universe, those that forward humanity as well as those that retard it. Now the appearance of Halley's Comet, or what, is, or what it signifies spiritually for the further evolution of humanity, is connected with what humanity had to absorb from the cosmos at the various periods of Kali Yuga, in order that thought should descend deeper into materiality. With every new appearance of this comet, a new impulse was born to drive the human ego further away from a spiritual cosmic conception and to urge it to grasp the world in a more materialistic way. This does not mean a descent into matter, but rather the driving of the spiritual substance that the human ego should draw from the universe for its spiritual existence down into the sphere of materialistic conception. All those conceptions of the second half of the 18th century that are called shallow and superficial, that Goethe so ridiculed in his title Poetry and Truth, and that found their exponent in Holbach's title Systeme de la Nature, 
French, sorry, are understood in their cosmic sense through the appearance of Halley's Comet in 1759. The commonplace materialistic literature of the second, third of the 19th century was preceded by the appearance of Halley's Comet in 1835. <clears throat> Events that take place microcosmically on the earth are macrocosmically connected with events of the great world. A new impulse toward materialism was again given by the appearance of Halley's Comet in 1835. Büchner, Vogt and Molchardt are examples of those who were influenced on earth by what appeared with Halley's Comet as a mighty sign from the cosmos. We are now to be confronted again in the near future, for humanity must be tested, must rise out of itself, must feel the resistance to spirituality so that it may unfold all the more forces for its reascent. We shall be confronted with the forces that the new appearance of this comet will send forth from the universe, forces that may lead humanity down into a still more arid and dreadful materialism. Something may be born that even the most arid and dry thoughts of the Büchner school could not have imagined. This possibility is a necessity, however. Only if man overcomes the opposing forces can he acquire the strong forces of the universe that are able to lead him up again. If we bear this in mind, we shall then encounter in the right way what we call signs from the heavens. This is really a fact, though what I have said must not be taken in a superstitious sense, but in the sense of a great cosmic law, that God is pointing from heaven to show men what they must do. The approaching appearance of Halley's Comet is one of those signs, and notice should be taken of it. A mighty ascending impulse must follow it, so that we may rise into spirituality from the depths of materialism into which we have sunk, we are given the possibility of being swamped by materialism, and we are also given the chance to ascend into clear spiritual heights. It was clearly and distinctly indicated in the last lectures that during the first half of the twentieth century an etheric clairvoyance will develop in a few single individuals as a natural capacity. In order that man may not sink more deeply into the materialism indicated by the present sign of 1910, those who possess an understanding of spiritual science have the possibility of developing those forces in the human soul that can lead man beyond materialism. If a man understands these forces, they will teach him how to see the etheric nature of Christ. We are living at an important crossroad when men will be taught even by signs from heaven that in one direction the path will lead deeper into the mire while the other will lead to the development of the forces that at the conclusion of Kali Yuga will bring etheric clairvoyance. <clears throat> the cry of John the Baptist, Change the disposition of your souls, applies also to us today. This may really be said. On the one hand, we are given the possibility of perishing in the materialistic morass. On the other, it is possible as a result of the sun reaching a certain point in the constellation of Pisces at the vernal equinox, that a certain etheric clairvoyance may be acquired. There are also signs along the spiritual ascent to show us how the forces come from the cosmos. If a man is a student of spiritual science, he will of necessity grow to understand the decision he must make. If he does not, it means that he has not understood spiritual science correctly. We must pass the test submitted to us by the sign in the heavens that we recognize in the appearance of Halley's Comet. Let us now picture the vision of Christ as it will appear to the first forerunners during the next 2,500 years and as it appeared to Paul on the way to Damascus. Man will ascend to a cognition of the spiritual world and will see the physical world permeated by a new sphere. Man's physical environment will present a totally different aspect in the course of the next 2,500 years through the addition of an etheric realm which indeed is already here and which we he will learn to perceive. This etheric sphere is even now spread out before the eyes of those who have carried their esoteric training as far as illumination, as was the case with the initiates even in Kali Yuga. What men will gradually come to see in the future is already visible to the initiates in its farthest reaches. 
At repeated intervals they draw the forces they require from it. When they have some special work to carry out, they draw their forces from those realms within the earth's orbit that are visible to them. It will help us to understand this when we know that a part of the land from which the initiates drew their forces during Kali Yuga will be thrown open to a great part of humanity during the next 2,500 years. Formerly in the days of primeval clairvoyance, though then without a strong ego consciousness, man could see into the spiritual world. In a way he saw more or less what he will see now with his newly acquired self-consciousness. He saw the spiritual world under dreamlike, ecstatic conditions or by looking into his soul. The world that became physical during Kali Yuga was then open to man's gaze. Hence traditions that have preserved recollections of the old clairvoyance tell of an unknown fairyland that has now disappeared. There are wonderful documents in Eastern literature that are full of a peculiar tragic enchantment. They tell us that at one time it was possible for human beings to travel to a land where the spiritual flowed into the physical. It is from this land that the initiates at certain times and the bodhisattvas of all, at all times drew fresh forces. The Eastern writings speak of this land with deep sorrow, asking where it is. We are told the names of places and paths they mourn, but this land is concealed even from the most highly initiated lamas of Tibet. It is accessible to the highest initiates alone, but it is always said that someday this land will return to earth. That is true. This land will return to earth, and men will be guided to it by him whom they will see when, through a vision like that of the event in Damascus, they reach the land of Shambhala. Shambhala, for thus is this land called, has withdrawn from men's sight. It can only be seen today by those who, as initiates, go there from time to time to be strengthened. The old forces can no longer lead men there. That is why Eastern literature speaks with such tragic despair of the vanished land of Shambhala. The Christ event, however, will be granted to men in this century through their newly awakened faculties, will bring back the very land of Shambhala that during all of Kali Yuga could be known to the initiates alone. Thus humanity is called upon to decide whether or not it shall allow itself to be led down into darkness even lower than that of Kali Yuga through the effects attendant upon Halley's Comet or through an understanding developed by Anthroposophy it shall cultivate the new faculties by which it may find the way to the land of Shambhala that has disappeared according to Eastern literature but that Christ will once more reveal. Such is the great decision to be made by men at the dividing of the ways. They must decide either to descend into something that is a cosmic Kama Loka, lies deeper than Kali Yuga, or to work toward achieving what will enable them to enter the realm that is truly alluded to as Shambhala.